I bet. That's why I'm here. I would hope so. <laughs> and a lot of visual learners. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm Dennis Sharp. I, I don't teach at MATC, but I teach part-time at Lakeland. I teach economics. I make lots of, well, I record my videos and post them. Awesome. And I make lots of graphs and things, but everything can always be better. And economics is most easily learned visually, I think, than charts. Than yeah. Charts are just talking about it. And Absolutely. So, um, Come on in. I totally agree. Fine. And thank you, for Dan, for helping me find the room. <laughs> we were looking for it at the same time. And I'm, I, I might be visual, but I'm not spatial at all. I cannot. I taught here for a decade, and I was a student. Still can't find rooms in this building, I'm sorry to say. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm Patrick Molzon. I teach at the Cabinet Making and Millwork. Um, and I was also trained as an artist, so I am a very visual person. And I do do that in my teaching, and my students are visual learners. And I'm always looking for how others are teaching, so that's why I came. Excellent. Thank you. Go ahead. My name is Claudette Suisel, and I work in the grants office. And we are um, developing training modules right now, and I did a couple of them. And I'm very visual, so I like a lot of color and things to make a dry topic more interesting. Absolutely. So I'm just here for kind of if I can learn new things for inspiration. That's why I'm here. Awesome. Behind her, go ahead. Um, my name is Catherine Leiden. I uh, teach English and primarily writing. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if I have more visual learners, but I'm interested in you know different ways to apply the material that I serve in. Excellent. Welcome. And last but not least, right uh, over here. My name is Claire Nolan. I don't work here at the college. I work with a lot of parents in education and employment um, and a lot of English language learners. So I thought that this would be um, oh, yeah. something that would be able to learn more visually rather than text. Absolutely. That's the great thing about visual uh, information is that you don't, it's multilingual. It's universal in a lot of ways. And Alan, um, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Do you all know Alan? <laughs> Hi, my name is Alan. I am a heavy visual learner. Um, I too was born around MTV time and I do like the short, <laughs> flashy stuff. Mm -hmm. and it really gets me into trouble when I'm developing materials for a seal. <laughs> <laughs> I just nitpick everything, but yeah, um, and I'm here live streaming the event so that not only can you see, but our audience on YouTube can see and reach out more people. So awesome. Trying to get the most bang for our buck here. Right, <laughs> for your buck for a free, mostly free event, but yeah, <laughs> that's what we're looking for. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Um, like I said, my name's Emily, and I've always been a very visual person. I've always enjoyed drawing. I've always enjoyed video. Um, the way I kind of found my path here is actually through movies and special effects. I'm a big old school special effects fan. I love puppetry. Jim Henson is one of my heroes. Um, Ray Harryhausen, who used to do stop motion animation for Clash of the Titans and other movies. I'm actually going to Prague this summer to meet Jan Svankmeyer, who's a Czechoslovakian stop motion artist. He's like my favorite living filmmaker. And so I did a Kickstarter, I get to visit his film set, and uh, I'm He's pretty wonderful. stoked. He is wonderful. And just talking about the senses, like I'm about to, he really kind of brings in beautiful sound with his visuals and just love that guy. Um, so I'm trying to learn Czech <laughs> right now, very slowly. Uh, so just overview, today we're gonna be talking about barriers to education, of which there are many, which most of you are very aware. Uh, we're also gonna touch on multiple intelligences, which very much ties into what we're gonna be discussing. Uh, that goes into learner types, and we're going to focus on visual, but just in case you haven't learned about VARC before, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about each, visual, auditory, read-write, and kinesthetic. And we'll talk about some tips for visual learners, and then some resources, of which there is no shortage. First, I just like this Einstein quote. Do you have a question? Yeah, I have a comment from oh. someone on live chat. Hi. Oh, we got someone watching, and her name is Helen, and she wants to know more about visual learners and how to beat them in their teleprint. Oh, well, thank you. Welcome. Uh, next is one of my favorite quotes. Everybody likes a quote against a picture. The Facebook has proven that. Um, <laughs> I've always liked this Einstein quote. He also had a birthday yesterday, so I, I like sharing that with him. And on Pi Day. Uh, so here's a fish, ironically. Uh, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Um, so if we kind of all teach people the same way, and they don't all learn that way, 
we can't reach all of our different learners. So expecting them all to learn the exact same way is kind of how I feel this quote encompasses that feeling. We can't hold people all to the same expectations, not in quality, but just in how they arrive there. Uh, you've probably have seen this before. I went to uh, UW Stout in career technical education and training. So I am, uh, <laughs> I've seen a lot of these triangle graphs <laughs> in my degree. And uh, this is how people learn. Um, I'm gonna show you Bloom's taxonomy in a moment, which is another pyramid. Uh, but the learning pyramid here talks about how people best take in information. And when you only lecture, your audience only takes in about 5%. If you have them read, they take in about 10. If there's audio visual, like a PowerPoint, I'm using Keynote today, it's more 20%. And then if you get into demonstration, like culinary, you get into 30%. So the more you engage these different learner styles, the more you reach the memorization of your students. These are things that they retain. Uh, this is also considered passive or traditional learning. And a lot of this follows what at least I did in high school. I would say 90% of my classes in high school were read-write. You read a book, you did a lecture, you did a report. It was always like that. What I'm really interested in is the active learning. Discussion is 50%. When we create these ideas, when we compare our answers and our ideas to other people, it really helps kind of cement <coughs> our understanding of it. Uh, practice by doing is super important at a school, especially a vocational college, uh, where students learn best by actually doing the thing, not just seeing it, but doing it. And my favorite is teaching others, 90% you are going to retain 90% of what you learn or more likely if you actually teach somebody else. And I don't know about the teachers in the room, but that's the reason I teach, is because I love to learn. And the more I already do this kind of stuff when I'm not at school. I'm actually on spring break this week. But I was like, visual learners, yes, <laughs> that's my thing. And I try to encourage my students to do that. Of course, I answer their questions, but I encourage them to ask each other. And it's amazing how much more they retain if they actually answer questions for one another. I have like a 10 second rule now where I don't immediately answer somebody's question and then they either figure it out or somebody helps them. Mm -hmm. And it's actually kind of amazing because uh, you want to make, make sure people are self-directed learners. I teach almost straight technology. Um, my specialty is software. So in visual communications, we teach video, animation, design, like traditional on paper, uh, but we do screen, interactive design. Uh, I do special effects and green screen techniques, so very visual. Um, and it, I love it when my students actually help each other. We've got a lot of projects in our program that are building tutorials. The students build a tutorial for other students to use. Uh, or maybe in your different fields, it could be building a fact sheet or building a learning tool but teaching others is the best way to learn. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. And that ties into our barriers of education as well. Um, a lot of learners have had a bad learning experience. I certainly had. I wish I could say that all of the schooling I've been through has been wonderful. <laughs> as a teacher, I wish I could say that. Uh, but I've had a lot of bad educational experiences. And I've had students that have also had bad experiences and definitely, without a doubt, lashed out at me because of them and other teachers. Um, so just being empathetic to what your students might have been through before. Uh, learning comes to the, the learner comes to the session with other problems on his or her mind and is unable to focus. We teach at a college level, but everybody has their inherent issues and problems. Uh, my favorite is in our program, I have a colleague that has three children that are under five. <laughs> And I have students that like to complain to her about lack of sleep. <laughs> and they have no idea <laughs> what they're talking about. Because uh, they, like, they just can't even comprehend. Uh, I'm not a parent, but my sister is a single mother and has a six-year-old daughter. And just the amount of work that goes into that, just if somebody's a parent <laughs> or a, a provider of some way, that's a huge thing. Um, and they all have jobs. Most of these students are working. I, when I was a student, I had three jobs. Two of them were full-time. I'm not sure how I did that, but I did. Um, learners interested in material, but they're constrained by time and focused on other priorities. I've seen this a lot. I was a victim of this. I had a pretty awful home life when I was a student. 
It's very close to dropping out several times. Uh, now I record all of my lectures. I believe you mentioned that as well, sir. And I record using a program called ScreenFlow, which is on the Mac, but there's all kinds of screen capture programs out there. And I don't edit it. If I edit it, I'm going to go down the rabbit hole <laughs> of formatting and adding effects and all these other things. I record it. I make sure there's no glaring errors. And then I just upload it the same day. And they have access to it on a Vimeo account anytime. <clears throat> so maybe if they weren't in the right mind space during class, it's something they can refer to later. Uh, some people need repeat hearings of things. I don't know if hearings is a word, but you know what I mean. Uh, learner suffers from imposter syndrome or excels in a different intelligence. Uh, I've seen this firsthand with my students as well, and this is something I studied at Stout. Imposter syndrome when you, is when you're already accomplished, but it's the fear you get from trying something new. We have a lot of students that have graduate degrees and they want something more hands-on or more practical. I've had a student that had two PhDs <laughs> crying in my classroom because she couldn't figure out how to do a mask in Photoshop. And she was an older woman in her 60s and I was like, you are smarter than anybody in this room. I can guarantee you that. Like you have more training and education, but this is just a new thing that you're not used to. You know, people are afraid of things they don't know. Uh, so that kind of ties into the empathy as well. Um, and then just different, in, different intelligences. I mentioned in high school, almost all of my classes were read, write. It's not how I learn. Um, I usually got out of doing a book report by doing a short film <laughs> instead, which they let me get away with. Or I'd be like, hey, that poster you got is looking kind of old. Can I redraw that for you? And throw in some lamination, and that somehow worked too. Um, <laughs> and finally, learners uncomfortable with the learning technique being used. This is common when learners are being introduced to new technology. <coughs> I teach almost 100% software. Um, when I was a student in my program, I had never used a Mac before. I had grown up around PCs, but I had never even seen a Mac. And I talked my way out of the intro class, which was a really bad idea. Um, so sometimes it's just that barrier, especially if you're working with something with equipment. Uh, that could be really scary. Um, <laughs> this goes back to that Einstein quote, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. <laughs> just not everybody can do the same things. There's read, write, and recall tests. I'm not good at tests either, where you're just regurgitating information. I'd much rather do something that requires me to write an essay or actually do the thing, do the task itself. Uh, going into multiple intelligences, any questions before I continue? Just about barriers of education? I'm sure most of you are aware of that, but I just wanted to lay the groundwork of why this other stuff's important. Go you ahead. You mentioned you record your presentation. Presentations you're giving live in class. Mm -hmm. Uh, about how long are they? Uh, it depends on how much coffee I've had. <laughs> uh, I average between 30 to 45 minutes for a lecture. I purposefully don't lecture more than an hour ever um, because I feel like people start tuning you out. And I try to appeal to all the different learner types. So I lecture quickly while I demonstrate. And then I, I usually have a three hour class. So the first hour is me showing examples and lecturing, and then I help people for the next two hours. So it doesn't matter how good my presentation is, not everybody's gonna get it the first time. Some of them need additional practice or to even listen to it again. So while I'm helping students, I'm uploading okay. that video to Vimeo. That was hard to say, but <laughs> it's usually there within the class period. So if people are really lost or they come in late, they can throw a pair of headphones on and actually listen to the lecture I just gave. So uh, it's pretty immediate, but I purposefully, just as a teacher, try to never lecture more than an hour. I used to be a corporate trainer, and my classes were eight hours long. <laughs> and around the six hour mark, you'd always see people kind of just get glassy looking. So I just really try to read the room and make sure people are with me still. And if they're not, try to do a different activity or take a break or something like that. Any other questions? So multiple intelligences is a term um, I've said a few times. You probably have all heard it as well. I think it's a really important thing to be aware of as educators that not all people are intelligent in the same way. Uh, there's a musical intelligence. There's body kinesthetic. Those are your athletes. When you see them do things in the Olympics, like I could never do that. That's body intelligence. Uh, people smart or interpersonal. 
There's word smart or verbal linguistics intelligence, logical mathematical, which I am not <laughs> at all, unfortunately. Naturalistic is one I've seen added lately. Intrapersonal or self smart and visual <laughs> spatial. Uh, none of these are mutually exclusive. You're usually a combination of all of these. It's just kind of a matter of what one is more dominant. And there's lots of different tests and quizzes out there that you can take or give to your students. And I actually really like to do an intelligent, not an intelligence quiz, but a learner style quiz, just to get an idea of how my students like to learn. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. So there's multiple inter intelligences, and there's a lot of different ways of expressing it. Some lists have three, some lists have 20. Uh, I like to use a system called VARC, which is visual, auditory, read, write, and kinesthetic. So this is kind of generalizing. Your logical and math are kind of down into read, write. Musical is kind of lumped into auditory. So it is a generalization. Uh, but VARC, I feel like, is a pretty solid way of looking at the four different learner styles. Um, so knowing what kind of learner you are is really interesting. And even if you don't do this for your students, I would try to find, if you just look up VARC quiz, I assure you, you will find so many resources out there. They can be pretty interesting. You might not be exactly what you thought. And I think that the combinations are fascinating. I'm visual, but I'm just as much kinesthetic. I like to do things. I'm the kind of person that just does something without reading the instructions and then go back and refer to the instructions if I do something wrong, um, which is the opposite of how my husband is. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're all a little bit of all of these, um, and we all teach to our own preference, which I also think is really important. So I teach very visually, but I'm aware that some of my students might be more read-write. So I try to have handouts. I try to make sure I can do closed captioning for videos. I try to make sure I appeal to all four of these learner styles. So visual learners tend to be fast talkers, case in point. <laughs> they exhibit impatience and have a tendency to interrupt. They use words and phrases that evoke visual images. And they learn by seeing and visualizing. Uh, I have a little mm, diagrams picture here from Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, which is one of the resources I've listed at the end of the presentation, but it's an amazing book. Uh, visual thinkers, best test type is diagrams, reading maps, essays, anything showing a process. They don't do well with listen and respond tests. So if there was like a language test and you had to fill in the blanks, that's not where visual learners excel. Uh, learning suggestions, draw or outline the information you need to remember. I make a lot of lists, personally. Copy what's on the board, diagram sentences. Use a lot of color. Highlighters are great for visual learners. Use flashcards. <coughs> and then just some of those characteristics are listed at the bottom. They often like to sit in the front of the class. Uh, they like to take detailed notes. I have saved my, my notebooks going back to grade school, and they are <laughs> covered in drawings, every single page. Um, and they often think in pictures. Auditory learners tend to speak more slowly and are natural listeners. They think in a more linear manner where visual can be very nonlinear. They like to have things explained to them rather than reading. And they learn by listening and verbalizing. Uh, so the best test type is writing responses to a lecture or oral exams. They don't like reading passages and writing answers in a timed test. Uh, they like to use word association for learning. Uh, they like to use recorded lectures and watch videos. So I really feel that could help everybody for multiple reasons. Uh, they repeat facts with eyes closed. That seems very specific. <laughs> they participate in group discussions and they record notes after writing them. Um, they tend to read kind of slowly. Um, like I said earlier, talking about multiple intelligences, these people might be more musically inclined. I have a few videos out there under an uh, artist named Melody Sheep that uses auto-tuning, and I'm actually convinced it could be a way to teach people because auto-tuning just kind of seals everything together, like resin, it's kind of interesting. Read-write learners, which is probably what I feel most education caters to, other than some oral, is they prefer for information to be displayed in writing, such as a list of ideas. They emphasize text-based input and output, and they enjoy reading and writing in all forms. So lots of book fans, of course, are read-write learners. Um, <laughs> I included Kelvin and Hobbes' comic here, where he's saying we're supposed to have this whole stupid book read by tomorrow, flip. 
There, it's a good way to get that out of the way. Reading goes faster if you don't sweat comprehension. Where's the frisbee? <laughs> My delivery there was poor, but you get the idea. <laughs> Uh, but some students do just kind of skim through, like they're not really digesting the information. Um, going back to that chart a little bit ago, reading is only 10% of when you take in information. So it's not, just because you read it doesn't mean you understand it by any means. Uh, kinesthetic learners tend to be the slowest talkers. They tend to be slow in decision making. They use all of their senses to engage in learning. So these are very lab type environment people. They learn by doing and solving real life problems and they like a hands-on approach and learning through trial and error. Uh, they like test types with short definitions, fill-ins and multiple choice. They don't like essays. Uh, they rather study in short blocks, take lab classes, go on field trips. It's a big thing for a kinesthetic learner, like see where the thing takes place. Use memory games. Uh, they get fidgety. And this is another one of those things that gets brought up with multiple intelligences is you've got people that are into dance or into performing and they're seen as bad students because they can't sit still or they're, you know, tapping their fingers or things like that. Uh, kinesthetic, kinesthetic learners can also do that. I got in trouble a lot as a kid because, I, like I said earlier, always drew in my notebooks. And it wasn't that I wasn't paying attention. That was how I processed the information. And my teachers did not understand that. I thought I was goofing around, but drawing actually helped me process it. If I just watched them and listened to them talk, I would totally zone out <laughs> and picture something else. So a lot of the times the drawing was actually helping me. Uh, <laughs> I use a lot of Bob Ross in my class, my students can tell you. And uh, I've used a lot of GIFs in here. So talent is a pursuit of interest. In other words, anything that you're willing to practice, you can do. So. We all have these multiple intelligences and aptitudes that things come easier to us, but with practice we can really learn anything over time. And Bob is a great example of that, because if you've ever watched him paint, holy crap, that guy's amazing. Like, I really do love Bob Ross. <laughs> so going into the main subject of visual learners, um, Describing the different type of learners, you probably can recognize them within your own class or even without doing a quiz, you probably have an idea of what kind of learner you are. Uh, for example, how many of you think you're auditory learners? A little bit. What about read-write? Kinesthetic? Yeah, I'm kinesthetic. And then visual? I'm very visual. Um, it turns out we're actually all visual learners, whether we think we are or not. 90% um, of the information that comes to the brain is visual. Um, so it doesn't matter what other thing we appeal to, we're a very visual species by nature. We use our eyes for a lot of things. Uh, question, who's a visual learner? Answer, everybody is. Oh God, that was an owl joke. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, who's? Oh no. Um, <laughs> I did this presentation for CETA last year and they asked if I would repeat it and I forgot. I, I was like, why do I have an owl? Oh, who? <laughs> uh, forty percent of all nerve fibers connected to the brain are linked to the retina, which is a pretty high percentage. So a lot of our brain <coughs> is just wired to take signals from our eyes, uh, regardless of anything else. Uh, visual learners, approximately sixty-five percent of the population are visual learners. So Catherine, I believe you mentioned, or Karen, you mentioned that you have a lot of. You don't think you have visual learners necessarily, but there might be more than you realize. Just yeah, right. It's, it's hard to say. And that's why doing the different quizzes and stuff can be really helpful. Uh, the brain processes visual information 60,000 times faster than text. So like economics, just seeing a graph of comparisons versus reading the numbers can have a huge impact. Uh, visual learners rely on color, shapes, images, and diagrams to take in information. Uh, they need to doodle, sketch, draw, and create to process what they've learned. Kind of like I did back in middle school, but what I got scolded for, because it wasn't seen as a learner type, it just was seen as being silly. Here's that other triangle diagram. I threatened uh, Bloom's taxonomy. <laughs> You've probably come across it somewhere in your education. Uh, it's interesting that we use understand and remember a lot as like goals for education, because they're actually the lowest level of education. That's just being able to recall. That's like fill in the blank style tests. Um, 
to be able to evaluate and create information, like creating learning tools, like I suggested earlier, that's really the height of knowledge. I can't use, yeah, of knowledge. I was gonna say understanding, but understanding's not that high up. <laughs> uh, so remembering is just able to recall facts and basic concepts, uh, word definition games. Um, lists, memorization. I can, most of my tests growing up were beaten by just remembering the answers. Like just, the teacher would give you a handout. It didn't require any kind of comprehension. You just remember what plugged in where. And if you could memorize it, you were able to pass the test. Um, understanding is explaining ideas or concepts. So that's where that discussion comes in. Applying is executing, implementing, solving, so passing a test in that subject would kind of count. Analyzing is drawing connections among ideas, being able to compare and contrast. Um, if you write like a paper comparing two issues, that would be an analyzing technique. Evaluation is justify a stand or decision, so you're able to appraise, defend, support, or value the information. And then creates really at the height. Um, you produce new or original work, you design, assemble, construct. Um, so you're making something new. You're using that information you were given and channeling into something that no one else has done before or something you haven't done before. Um, so having like a final project in the art programs, uh, whether it's animation, photography, visual communications, or graphic design, they create a portfolio. That's kind of the height of the degree. And it should happen at two years but if they need more time, then that's fine. But creating that portfolio, that peak of your work, is kind of the end goal in our programs. Um, and that applies to all multimodal, multimodal learners. There could be a lot of different ways that you create. Uh, tips and tricks with visual learners. It's my favorite GIF. <laughs> uh, visual brainstorming techniques, which I'm gonna cover next. Uh, Jiffy, which I got all these GIFs from, and image creators. Uh, I'm using rather silly GIFs, but I'm going to show you the website when I'm done uh, with the keynote, and you can look up really any topic. GIFs are just a movie that doesn't need a movie player, but there's actually some out there that demonstrate different things in nature or mathematical equations. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, use Adobe Color or just be aware of color palettes and style hierarchy. So if you use Word, be aware of headlines, subheadings, paragraphs. It might not seem like a big deal, but text size and boldness really helps visual people parse information. It helps all people. But being able to scan a document and see where the headings are uh, and keywords is really important. Uh, one of my favorite websites is wordmark.it. Uh, of course, you're welcome to get fonts from defont.com and other websites like that. Uh, Word Market will actually show you the fonts on your machine if you're not familiar with them. And you could type out the word you're looking for and come back to it. Um, I will show you that. I'm just worried about switching feeds and not getting it back for some reason. Uh, Microsoft Office formatting hacks. <laughs> when I was a corporate trainer, one of my jobs was recreating things done by an ad agency so that their client could actually use it. So the ad agency would make this gorgeous thing in InDesign and the client would be like, that's great, we don't have InDesign. <laughs> so I would create that document in Word. And you can use Word for a layout program, it's just not meant to be that way. You have to be mindful of the Word run around. All the, it, Microsoft programs tend to assume that you don't know what you're doing. So they'll try to auto format, they'll try to scale things based on sizing. There's a lot of hacks, so to speak, to get around that, that I employed over the years. Um, and then there's a lot of videos out there, regardless of what topic you teach. I love TED Talks. I watch those just on my own time. Uh, we're actually gonna watch one in a little bit. Uh, but the TED Talks are amazing and they really range in every topic you can imagine. Um, there's tons of YouTube and video channels out there too, but make sure you watch it first. <laughs> I have made the mistake of watching videos in class that I thought I'd watch before and then something comes up like, I'm glad I teach college or, <laughs> If you do like an image search, you'd be surprised the innocent sounding words you could type in and the things that can come up in a Google image search. I usually pick mute on the projector when I search for stuff just in case because meta tags are not your friends all the time. Uh, and same thing goes for YouTube comments. Never scroll past the video, ever. 
even if it's like an educational video, don't even don't even go below it. Something horrible will be written that none of your students need to see. So speaking of TED Talks, one of my favorite TED Talks is about drawing toast, of all things. And uh, something my students do a lot of is brainstorming. Um, well, something they should be doing a lot of is brainstorming. Uh, I wish I had a formula to show that how much time students spend on paper reduces the amount of time that they spend on the computer. If you plan things out on paper first, whether it's writing, whether it's drawing, storyboarding in my field, even drawing thumbnails, the quality of your work on the computer will be better and it won't take you as much time because you're not messing around with the technical stuff. So I really try to get my students to plan in advance. Um, I actually came across this presentation when I taught a middle school class a few summers ago. I teach Movie Maker Boot Camp every summer for middle schoolers. And this was something I came up with for them, because teaching them about uh, drawing and the importance of drawing by yourself or in groups. Um, so brainstorming, it's important to know that when you're brainstorming, no idea is wrong. Everything's welcome. It's not the time to turn down ideas or criticize somebody. Um, it can be done alone or in groups. And you want to use visual thinking, uh, mind maps, and outlines, whatever it takes. Uh, Post-it notes and index cards are probably two of my most used tools. Um, they're great because you can move them around. You're not committing to a whole sheet of paper. I'm kind of a hippie, so I like to use as little paper as possible. Um, but this drawing toast, I think, is a really great TED Talk. And I think I have time to show it, actually. Uh, and it also just, I think, describes these different concepts of breaking down information um, in a way that really encourages people to use visual learning. So let's make sure see if this even launches. <laughs> oh, before we do that, yes, sir. of their different things here and I'm just going to go right to the TED talk which they conveniently have. Some years ago I stumbled across a simple design exercise that helps people understand and solve complex problems and like many of these design exercises that kind of seems trivial at first but under deep inspection, it turns out that it reveals unexpected truths about the way that we collaborate and make sense of things. The exercise has three parts, and it begins with something that we all know how to do, which is how to make toast. Uh, it begins with a clean sheet of paper, a felt marker, and without using any words, you begin to draw how to make toast. And most people draw something like this. They draw a loaf of bread, which is sliced, they put it into a toaster, the toaster is then deposited for some time, <laughs> it pops up, and then voila, after two minutes, toast and happiness. Now, over the years, I've collected many hundreds of drawings of these toasts, and some of them are very good because they really illustrate the toast-making process quite clearly. And then there are some that are, well, not so good. It's actually, they really suck, actually, because you don't know what they're trying to say. <laughs> Under close inspection, some reveal some aspects of toast-making while hiding others. So there's some that it's all about the toast, right? And it's all about the transformation of toast. And there's others that are all about the toaster, okay? And, and the engineers love to draw the, the mechanics of this. <laughs> and then there are others that are about people. You know, it's, it's about visualizing the experience uh, that people have. And then there are others that are about the supply chain of making toast that goes all the way back to the store. It goes through the supply chain networks of teleportation <laughs> and all the way back to the, the field and, uh, and we and that one actually goes all the way back to the Big Bang. So, <laughs> crazy stuff. That, but I think uh, it's obvious that, that even though these drawings are really wildly different, they share a common quality. And I'm wondering if you can see it. See it? What's common about these? So, most drawings have nodes and links. So, nodes represent the tangible objects like the toaster and people, and links represent the connections between the nodes. And it's the combination of links and nodes that produces a full systems model. And it makes our private mental models visible about how we think something works. So, that's
that's the, the value of these things. And what's interesting about these systems models is how they reveal our various points of view. So for example, uh, Americans make toast with a toaster. That seems obvious. Whereas many Europeans make toast with frying pan, of course. And uh, many students make toast with a fire. I don't really understand this. A lot of MBA students do this. So you can measure the complexity by the, counting the number of nodes. And the average illustration has between four and eight nodes. Uh, less than that, the drawing seems trivial, and but it's quick to understand. And more than 13, the drawing uh, produces a feeling of mapping shock. It's too complex. So the sweet spot is between 5 and 13. So if you want to communicate something visually, have between 5 and 13 nodes in your diagram. So though we may not be skilled at drawing, the point is that we intuitively know how to break down complex things into simple things and then bring them back together again. So this brings us to our second uh, part of the exercise, which is how to make toast but now with sticky notes or with cards. So what happens then? Well, with cards, most people tend to draw clear, more detailed, and more logical notes. You can see the step-by-step -step analysis that takes place. And as they build up their model, they move their nodes around, kind of rearranging them like Lego blocks. Now, though this might seem trivial, it's actually really important. This rapid iteration of expressing and then reflecting and analyzing uh, is really the only way in which we get clarity. It's the essence of the design process. And system theorists do tell us that the ease with which we can change a representation correlates uh, to our willingness to improve the model. So sticky note systems are, are, are uh, not only more fluid, they generally produce way more nodes than static drawings. The drawings are much richer. And this brings us to our third part of the exercise, which is to draw how to make toast this time in a group. So what happens then? Well, here's what happens. It starts out messy, and then it gets really messy, and then it gets messier. But as people refine the models, the best nodes become more prominent, and with each iteration, the model becomes clearer, and because people build on top of each other's ideas. What emerges is a unified systems model that integrates the diversity of everyone's individual points of view. And so that's a really different outcome from what usually happens in meetings, isn't it? So these drawings can contain 20 or more nodes, but participants don't feel map shock because they participate in the building of their models themselves. Now, what's also really interesting is that the groups spontaneously mix and add additional layers of organization to them. To deal with contradictions, for example, they add branching patterns and parallel patterns. Um, oh, by the way, if they do it in complete silence, they do it much better and much more quickly. Really interesting. Talking gets in the way. So, Here's some key lessons that, that, that can emerge from this. First, drawing helps us. Produce better systems models because we iterate much more fluidly. And then the group notes produce the most comprehensive models because we synthesize several points of view. So that's interesting. We, you know, when people work together under the right circumstances, group, group models are much better than individual models. And um, so this approach works really great for uh, uh, drawing how to make toast. But what if you wanted to draw something more relevant or pressing, like um, your organizational vision, or customer experience, or long-term sustainability? There's a visual revolution that's taking place as more organizations are addressing their wicked problems by collaboratively drawing them out. And I'm convinced that those who see their world as movable nodes and links uh, really have an edge. And the practice is really pretty simple. You start with a question, you collect the nodes, you refine the nodes, you do it over again, you refine and refine and refine, and the patterns emerge and the group gets clarity, and you answer the question. So this simple act of visualizing and doing it over and over again produces some really remarkable outcomes. What's really important to know is that it's the conversations that are the important aspects, not just the models themselves. And these visual frames of reference can grow to several hundreds 
or even thousands of nodes. So one example is from an organization called Rodale, a big publishing company. They lost a bunch of money one year, and their executive team for three days visualized their entire practice. And what's interesting is that after visualizing the entire business, systems upon systems, they reclaimed $50 million of revenue, and they also moved from a D rating to an A rating from their customers. Why? Because there's alignment from the executive team. So, I'm now on a mission to help organizations solve their wicked problems by using collaborative visualization. On a site that I've produced called drawtoast.com, I've collected a bunch of the really, I think, best practices. Uh, and so you can learn how to run a workshop here. You can learn more about the visual language and the structure of links and nodes uh, that you can apply to general problem solving um, and uh, download examples of various templates for uh, unpacking the thorny problems that we all uh, face in our organizations. So the seemingly trivial design exercise of drawing Toast helps us get clear, engaged, and aligned. So next time you're confronted with an interesting challenge, remember what design has to teach us. Make your ideas visible, tangible, and consequential. It's simple, it's fun, it's powerful, and I believe it's an idea worth celebrating. Thank you. Circumstances, group models are much better than individual models. Communications and storyboarding, whether we're storyboarding a short film or animation or even just a nonlinear project. Uh, websites, for example, we often use post it notes to figure out what information we want, how it's going to be grouped, what the branching hierarchy is like. Um, so I feel like just, I really like the study behind that, just the difference between uh, the impact of amount of nodes and information. Um, I used to teach a lot of PowerPoint classes, and I always told people that you should never have more than five slides without a picture. When you have just text after text after text, sometimes the student doesn't even realize the slide is advanced because <laughs> it's just it's all these bullet points mm -hmm. over and over again. So just having visuals every few slides or even just sharing the slide with the visual I think is really helpful. Um, Something that's on that Draw Toast site is some different charts and diagrams that can help you or your students kind of map things out. I really like using an informal approach to brainstorming, and my favorite way is probably mind mapping. Has anyone here ever heard of mind mapping before? Okay, so it's supposed to be informal. If you look up mind mapping, it's unfortunate because you're mostly gonna get programs or apps about mind mapping. And to me, that's the opposite. We're not trying to be technical. We're trying to keep it really organic. Um, I have colored pencils in my office specifically for this reason. Um, mind maps, uh, you want to use a lot of color. Uh, you basically have your central idea in the middle, and then you branch out all the ideas from that. Um, so drawing pictures in, is encouraged. Um, not using graph or line paper, just regular drawing paper, computer paper is fine. Um, you don't want to use a computer if possible. I'm a big software nerd, but I never mind map on the computer. So I just immediately get caught up in what font I'm using and things like that. Um, and just keep it really simple, colorful, and just like I said, free flowing. You know, don't overthink it. This is the preliminary thing. This is the sketch of your idea. And from here you could develop a typed list or other things. Uh, so this is a mind map about how to mind map, which I find very meta. Uh, some other examples, here's one about learning the language. So different schemes, immersion, mistakes, persistence, mimicking, play. You can kind of see how they keep branching out as they become more specific in their ideas. Here's one between left brain and right brain, which also ties into some of the things we're talking about today. Um, all of us have a more dominant half of the brain, or mostly, so, uh, you know, I'm very creative. I'm not so good with the logical stuff, as my husband could tell you. <laughs> Numbers, forms, paperwork, that kind of stuff, I just, I'd rather go play with paint or something instead. Um, and uh, just understanding the difference between the two, but I like, that, I like this chart and how they have the legend underneath of info processing, project engagement, perception, workflow, problem solving. Here's one about the human body or major systems. So you can see how this might really help 
a student studying this to really learn. And if they make this themselves, remember that's part of that creation process. Don't just give them a handout. I actually never print out handouts anymore because students look at it and they put it in their folder or they throw it out. They usually don't throw it out in front of me. <laughs> uh, I said I'm a hippie. I usually just don't print things anyways. I do make handouts, but I don't print them. I keep them in PDF form on the server and they can print them if that's what they'd like to do. A lot of students these days prefer to have the digital version. Um, but unless, if you do handouts, I would remove some of the information from it and make them fill in the rest. Don't make it a complete sheet. Make it something that they need to finish the diagram or write things in. Make them take some ownership of that handout. Otherwise, it's just gonna be like junk mail to them. Um, and we've probably all been guilty of that too, unless you really read right. You get handed a sheet of paper and you're like, okay, that's nice. Every convocation, I'm, get, I'm on film saying this, I'm sorry, but I'm like, oh, look at this stack of colorful paper. I'll just glance at this later. Um, so just having interactive documents, I think, could really help with that. Uh, here's a really lovely one about art and design with imagination as a resource. So you can see it's still a mind map, but it has this kind of radial design to it where things are coming out from the center. And uh, any questions about mind mapping or brainstorming techniques? Uh, just a few resources, though there's so many more than I'm listing here. Um, if you don't consider yourself a designer, uh, there's a really great book called The Non-Designer's Design and Type Book by Robin Williams. Not the late hairy comedian, but a very nice English woman uh, that I've met a few times. It's a great book. It's one of the few, <laughs> it's one of the few books we recommend. It's actually the only required book in my program. Um, we don't have textbooks in my program just because we're teaching mostly software. And software books become obsolete in a matter of months. So I'm not going to make my students buy something if the information's not relevant. Um, I'm very, I'm pretty anti-textbook, to be honest with you. Not because I'm against reading, but because I'm against the prices the textbooks have. I wouldn't spend $50 over a book on something I enjoy. I wouldn't expect a student to pay $300 for a book that they're forced to buy. So just finding alternatives or using fair use where you can like scan or have handouts from books is definitely a good way to go. Or just embedding the few diagrams you need in a PDF or PowerPoint. We have a lot of leeway as educators. Um, but the non-designers design and type book is an awesome resource. I've got a few um, of the pages coming up. Don't Make Me Think is another great book um, by Steve Krug. It's mostly about web usability. But it's also just good, I think, for anybody developing materials. It talks about not having a lot of happy talk or clutter when you're writing, having like really strong, clean hierarchy when you design. Um, and then understanding comics is the one I have pictured here. Um, Scott McCloud, it's actually a comic book about comic books, but it's not just comic books. It's about sequential art. It's about visual thinking. It talks a lot about just how we learn and take in visual information, but it's one of my favorite books. Uh, here's the cover of Non-Designer's design book. Uh, I like it because she really breaks down what's needed. Uh, good design is as easy as one, two, three. Learn the principles, recognize when you're not using them, and apply them. Um, is, and what's cool is that this right here is just an example of what the book does. The top example is very little design. There's no hierarchy. There's bold text. The bottom one is the same exact typography, but with a little style applied is that much more appealing. And so in a nutshell, <laughs> that's kind of what you can do with your own documents. Just choosing a color scheme or really just adding that hierarchy, do lists, have heading text, have subheadings, things like that. Um, the thing I like most about the non-designer's design book is she breaks down what you need into four principles, contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. But the best thing is that the acronym for that is CRAP. <laughs> and so <laughs> if you don't use it, that's what your designs tend to look like. So contrast is just having a focal point. I often say if you just blur your eyes at something or if you're like me and need glasses and just lift them up, if you can't immediately identify something on the page, there is no focal point. And that's more important than design than learning materials, but still something to be aware of. Uh, repetition is when you use styles again and again. All headings are this size and this font and this color. All bullet points look like this. All images are formatted like this. 
alignment just helps us with the hierarchy and reading uh, nice and smoothly and easily. If it's not a poem, don't center align it. <laughs> you know, have that even left edge for students to read along. Uh, and then proximity, show groups of information by putting them close together um, or having subgroups and things like that. That's very much in a nutshell, but those are kind of the four principles. Uh, so it's a really great book that I highly recommend. Don't make me think, like I said, it's more about web design, uh, but it's really interesting stuff. It's like user, like somebody might design a page with the left top on mind, but what the person actually looks at is to the right. We don't really read things in a left, right, top, down matter. We don't read online like we read in a book. We definitely look for contrast. We look for the shiny thing or the thing that's animating and kind of go from there. So just designing for screen versus print is very much something to be aware of. And then the bottom graphic is another one from Understanding Comics. Uh, it just says, in comics, the conversion follows a path from mind to hand to paper to eye to mind. Ideally, the artist's message will run this gauntlet without being affected by it, but in practice, this is rarely the case. Uh, but I just really like Scott McCloud's storytelling abilities and the way he conveys information. It's not just comic book. It goes back to like hieroglyphics and like mother language and things like that. So it's really interesting book. All three of these books, go figure, are very visual. <laughs> I do read books with just words in them, just to clarify but I do like the ones with pictures. I have a lot of Einstein in this presentation, but if I never teach my pupils, I only attempt to provide the conditions in which they can learn. Um, all any educator can do is just try to facilitate the best conditions for learning. One of the triangle graphs I don't have in here is that you, know, you need to provide like a safe, comfortable place for people, Maslow's hierarchy, <laughs> the other triangle. Uh, Students don't learn unless they feel comfortable, safe, accepted, and that their opinions are valued. So I mean, we can do as much as we can, but that doesn't always mean learning's gonna take place. Um, so hopefully today you learned a few things that might help you just appeal to those visual learners or just think about the way you're offering information. Um, and thank you. Are there any questions, ideas, or toast? <laughs> oh wait, this is a GIF too. Yes, I love dinosaurs. I like that I just verbally added that to the end, as if you couldn't tell by the animated T-Rex. Uh, real quick, there's a few websites I mentioned in the few minutes I have left here, unless there's any questions. Um, I kind of flashed it up there, and I have some cards up here too, but my email is epearson at madisoncollege.edu, so I'm happy to talk about this kind of stuff anytime. Um, I'm here Monday through Thursday every week. Like I said, I teach full time right down in the E-Wing over here on the second floor. Even if you just want to come see our TV studio or learn about our program, or I even have my students available as interns for different projects. So if you really want more visuals but don't know where to start, I'm more than happy to answer your questions about that. Um, I mentioned a few websites I just wanted to show you real quick. Um, Jiffy.com is pretty silly but pretty awesome. That's where I got all the different GIFs. And uh, you can search for just about anything. This is one of those things that I wouldn't project. <laughs> I would find what you're looking for. Uh, what was one of the subjects you guys mentioned earlier? Um, I'm trying to think of something valuable I could type in here. He does? See, now there's an example of why we don't project it, is guys with breadsticks in their pants, see? <laughs> you guys can all learn from my example here. Um, but Jiffy's, Jiffy's great not only just for searching for stuff, but also you can make GIFs with this website. So you can search for whatever. Uh, here's some nature ones. And GIFs, if you don't know, are just a file format that just loop. So they're silly, but sometimes they, they've become, <laughs> they've become back. I was a web teacher over a decade ago before I started teaching here. And GIFs were something we kind of got rid of for a while, and now they're like this huge cool thing. It's very strange to me. Uh, but there's a create button here, and you can just paste in any YouTube, Vine, or any video URL, and it will make a GIF. Um, so it, if you can't find what you're looking for, just go to the video, paste it in, and uh, basically it will allow you to make a GIF based on that. If I just look for one real quick here, I'm going to go with my default, which is Bob Ross. <laughs> Bob 
Bob Ross, I find extremely soothing in general. Oh, Mystic Mountain, this is a good one. So, if we, oh, ugh, ads, why? Sorry, people at home that are watching an ad within an ad, that's horrible. Someone who desires more than just beauty alone. Apologize. I wasn't planning on making a joke, but I also have a certain amount of spontaneity in my classes. I really want to recreate this with my students. I love this painting thing with the overalls. I would not be the one wearing the overalls, though. I've made that very good. I have a colleague named Bob, so I think he should really be the one. Uh, but yeah, you just paste the URL in. It loads the video. There's not a length limitation on the video. Oh, it must be 15 minutes or less. Of okay. course, I grabbed one that was too long as an example. My bad. But if you have any kind of, you could always find a shorter clip. I didn't look at the length. I just grabbed whatever YouTube video is there. Ah, uh, but yeah, 15 minutes is the, uh, let me go back out here. Let's use our, can we get to this video? I'm struggling with the little mouse pad down. <laughs> no, it links directly to, um, a different thing. TEDx, it doesn't link to YouTube. Jerks. Oh, let's just go back here. I'll just find a shorter Bob video. Um, they're also lengthy. So if you have like a nature video or anything, here's a 40 second one. This is practically the cheapest. You can do that. Yeah, this is just dark color so we can put a lighter color on top of it later. It'll stand up. We absolutely have to have dark in order to have light. Gotta have dark. Gotta have opposites. Dark and light. Light and dark. Continually in a painting. You have light on light. start time and then duration. So here I can increase the duration and you could see this bar increase here. And then you could write a caption and tags, but then it exists online forever. <laughs> um, if you want to share it on something like Facebook, you need to copy the image address, but Jiffy is a really cool resource. And like I said, YouTube, Vimeo, Ted has amazing talks. I would probably start there. Uh, the other website I mentioned was wordmark.it. Uh, wordmark.it just will allow you to uh, look up what fonts you have on your machine. So you might be surprised. <laughs> I might be surprised you don't have Flash installed. <laughs> I was going to say, Alan, what kind of fonts are we going to find on here? If it was like all Star Trek fonts, I was going to laugh and laugh. Because that would be, that's very personal looking at somebody's fonts. I should have asked you first, but. That's not my usual machine, so I have no fear. <laughs> <laughs> Normally that will work. I'm not going to involve insta Sorry, install flash, that's, yeah. that's Flash is just a jerk. And then if you don't find a font that you like, um, probably my favorite resource for fonts is dafont.com, dafont.com. Uh, it's not an attractive website. I feel like I need to say that, being someone talking about visual. <laughs> Uh, but it is nice because they have all these different categories up here. So if you were doing something about medieval times, you can go to medieval. Here's all your fonts. And I would tell my students to be mindful of whether or not it's free. You should probably also be aware of that. Uh, if you look at more options, you could say free for personal use or 100% free. Um, most of these are free. Some of them are donationware. Some require a one-time fee. Um, but you can find these fonts and then basically you just click download. This will go into a folder and then on a Mac it's going to be a true type font or TTF file. It might be different for a PC but you would just double click on the font and not try to rename it. <laughs> I'm, using, I'm not good with a mouse pad but if I click install font then I could use this for my economics paper because <laughs> <laughs> clearly that's what she would use it for. Uh, but you would be surprised how far a font can go. Even if you don't have visuals, just choosing like a fun heading to kind of put students in the mindset of what you're going to be learning about could be really cool. Uh, but there's just so many things out there to use. 
and to have fun with. Uh, I was trying to think of any other websites I wanted to show you really quick. I can't think of anything, but just Google image search too uh, is something I use daily for multiple things. But if you go to your image search, um, another thing I remind my students of, remember not to normally do this or save, mm -hmm. but um, if you're looking for something to use, like I said, I screen flow all my stuff. So I like to make sure that the graphics and things I use are available for me to use since I'm putting them out there on the internet. Um, for my portfolio students, I don't want them to use anything copywritten. So if you're mindful about that, just be just know that when you go to a Google image search, uh, you can go to your tools and go to usage rights. And you're able to say labeled for you reuse with modification or not. And I do this all the time. I never use something I can't reuse um, just in case. I just don't want to use someone else's copywritten thing. Maybe you don't think of it as much in your different fields, but just being a visual person where my students are creating content, we would never want to grab someone else's graphic and use it without permission. Um, so being able to choose labeled for reuse or reuse with modification, it's nice, because then you know all the images that come up are fair game. Um, so it's just a nice thing to be aware of. And there are some cats. Some Alan? Cats. <laughs> I'm sorry, the time is now. It's okay. I'm, I'm going to end on cats. I'm done on cats here, so that's a perfect thing to end on. I have some business cards up here if anybody would like some. Thank you all so much. I hope that it was helpful. And uh, feel, feel free to contact me anytime. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.